When comparing coffee machine models A and B, we see that going from a CP of 1.0 to 1.33 reduces defects from 1 out of 400 to 1 out of 20,000. To achieve that, we reduce the process standard deviation from 3.33 degrees to 2.5 degrees. Another possible way to increase process capability is to widen the range we offer the customer so that we can fit more standard deviations within it. Even with the Model A machine and a standard deviation of 3.33, I could achieve a CP of 1.33 by increasing my advertised temperature range to 160 degrees plus or minus four standard deviations. But if I offered you coffee between 146.67 degrees and 173.33 degrees instead of 150 to 170, would you still pay $2? What price would be acceptable to you? Would I be able to break even at this price? Let us say I go even further and I shoot for Six Sigma quality by offering coffee between 140 degrees and 180 degrees. Would there even be a market for such coffee? Often, the only reasonable option to increase process capability is to reduce process variability. Looking at the capability scale, even a small increase in capability, that is, even a small reduction in process variability, can have a tremendous payoff in terms of improved quality. Yet, if it were so easy to improve quality, wouldn't every process in the world be Six Sigma capable? Clearly, it is not so easy to reduce process variability, nor is it inexpensive. As you can imagine, reducing process variability involves time, effort, and money. Moving up from model A to B to C to D means spending a whole lot more money. If I compare the increased cost of a more capable model, versus the cost of wasting a few cups of coffee, I am likely to choose the lowest end model, that is Model A. This model is 3 Sigma capable and produces 99.75% good output. Throwing out one defective cup out of 400 doesn't sound too bad, does it? Then why is there all this fuss about Six Sigma processes? Is it just a fancy buzzword? Why would a company seek such extreme quality levels? Wouldn't it be prohibitively expensive? The company that is credited with coming up with the idea of Six Sigma is Motorola. What might have motivated that company? If their customers won't tolerate Three Sigma quality, that is one defective cell phone out of every 400, can't Motorola settle for Four Sigma quality, that is one defect out of every 20,000? Do you really need a Six Sigma capable process? that produces only one defect in 500 million? Are cell phone customers really that picky? Another company that is associated with the Six Sigma buzzword is GE. Okay, granted you don't want to produce one defective jet engine out of every 400, but for dishwashers, isn't one defect in 500 million overkill? Let us think back to what might have motivated Motorola to pursue Six Sigma quality. A typical electronic product is made up of dozens, if not hundreds, of components. Take for example a simple scientific calculator that sells for $9.99. Suppose you open the back of the calculator and pull apart every single component with a pair of pliers. You are likely to have quite a colorful pile. You can easily end up with over 100 components. Say I am the manager of the factory that is producing this calculator. I am pretty smug that the processes within my factory operate at a three sigma capability level. Back in my factory, here is a machine that produces one of the blue buttons. Improving the process capability could run into hundreds or even thousands of dollars. Instead, throwing away one defective button out of every 400 costs me in the order of pennies. Why would I bother to improve the process? Likewise, here is my second machine, which is also Three Sigma capable. It produces a teensy-weensy component that also costs a few pennies. I can afford to throw away one defective component out of every 400. 
and so on for all the 100 components that go into making the calculator. So now each of the components for making the calculator has a 99.75% chance of working correctly. Here is the first component, which is 99.75% reliable. Then I add the second component, which is also 99.75% reliable. What are the chances that both of these components will work correctly? We are drawing a probability tree diagram to see all the possible combinations. The probability that both components will work correctly is 99.75% times 99.75% or 99.5%. Then I add the third component, which is also 99.75% reliable. What are the chances that all three components will work correctly? 99.75 times 99.75 times 99.75 or 99.25%. Likewise, I include all the 100 components. Let us assume that I am using a flawless assembly process, but even if one of the components is defective, the calculator will be defective. What is the probability that all 100 components will work correctly? The reliability of the calculator will be 99.75 times 99.75 times 99.75, and so on, 100 times. That is 0.9975 raised to the power 100, which comes to 0.7785. Therefore, about 78% of the calculators will be defect-free, and 22% will be defective. Think about what that means. Here I am, smug that my factory is producing only one defect in 400. So when I produce a box of 1,000 calculators, I expect to find 2.5 defects on average. But when I actually open the box, I am shocked to find 22% or 220 defective calculators. How long before I go out of business? How about if I had a calculator made up of 200 components? Only 60.6% .6 of the products will be defect-free. In the electronics industry, most products are made from dozens of components, often even hundreds of components. Thus you can see why settling for 3 sigma capability would be totally inadequate. How about instead, I upgraded all my processes to a 4 sigma level. Now each component is 99.995% reliable. The reliability of the calculator will be 0.99995 raised to the power 200. Therefore, about 99% of the calculators will be defect-free. In a box of 1,000 calculators, I can expect to find 10 defects on average. Likewise, if I upgraded all my processes to a 5 sigma level, each component is 99.99995% reliable. Therefore, about 99.99% of the calculators will be defect-free. In a box of 1,000 calculators, I can expect to find 0.1 or one-tenth of a defect, or one defect in 10 boxes. Finally, if I upgraded all my processes to a Six Sigma level, each component is 99.9999998% reliable. Therefore, about 99.99996% of the calculators will be defect-free. I can expect to find one defect in 2.5 million, or one defect in 2,500 boxes. Even for a calculator made of 200 components, Six Sigma level quality does seem like overkill. But we have not yet taken into account that even when the process variability is designed for the Six Sigma level, the process itself may be off-center. Recall the difference between CP and CPK for the coffee machine example. A Six Sigma process design allows for the process mean to shift about one and a half standard deviations Therefore, the process mean is not really six standard deviations from the edge, but rather only four and a half standard deviations away. Even though CP will be 2.0, CPK will be only 1.5. Such a process will produce about 3.4 defects per million. That is, it will be 99.99966% reliable. To produce my calculators, let us say I upgrade my processes to a Six Sigma level 
but factor in a one and a half standard deviation shift. Each of my 200 components is 99.99966% reliable. Therefore, about 99.93% of the calculators will be defect free. In a box of 1000 calculators, I can expect to find 0.7 or 7 tenths of a defect or one defect in every 1.43 boxes. This 99.93% calculator reliability is in the same ballpark as the 99.75% we associate with 3 sigma capability. As we can see here, when the number of components increases, even if we have 6 sigma processes, the final output will only be in the 3 sigma ballpark. Conversely, if we desire 3 sigma quality at the final output stage, we need much higher quality levels at upstream stages of our process. Little wonder then that a company like Motorola would seek Six Sigma capability, and GE too. This principle is not limited to companies in the electronics industry or other manufacturing companies. Any time we desire a high quality level at the final output stage, we need to ensure much higher quality levels at upstream stages of the process. Any time several sub-processes come together, each of those sub-processes has to have a very high level of reliability before the final process output can even hope to have a half-decent level of reliability. Let us say you are in charge of an accounting process that puts together a report for senior management. Let us say 20 pieces of information are used to prepare the report. Each of these pieces of information has been prepared by separate sub-processes and populated into different tabs on several Excel spreadsheets. Let us further say that each of these 20 sub-processes is 3 sigma capable and produces 99.75% reliable output, or produces only one defect out of 400. What are the odds that your final report will be accurate? Only about 95%. After you present that report to your senior management, make sure to polish up your resume. That is the state of affairs if your sub-processes are 99.75% reliable. What does a 99.75% reliable subprocess look like? Think about an employee who makes 400 spreadsheet entries but makes one mistake. Are you talking about a superhuman being? When was the last time you made 400 spreadsheet entries but made only one mistake? Forget about Excel. When was the last time you were able to simply type 400 words in a word processor, that's a little under two pages double spaced, but made only one typo? Are you saying Microsoft Word didn't give you all those squiggly lines? I'll believe that when I see it. Each of your accounting sub-processes is probably nowhere close to 99.75% reliability. That is when you need to adopt my garage sale airplane trick. Let us say I found an old airplane at a garage sale and fell in love with it. Don't laugh, that's all I can afford. The problem is, the engine is only 95% reliable. There's a 1 in 20 chance of failure. On top of that, this plane has two engines. The reliability of the plane now becomes 95% times 95%, which is only about 90%. That's a 1 in 10 chance of failure. I think I'll go out right away and buy myself a good parachute and some life insurance as well. On the other hand, Suppose I told you that one engine is sufficient to keep the plane aloft. Let us look at the probability tree diagram. My concern is only about both the engines failing. The probability of that happening is only 0.25% or 1 in 400. Equipped with two independent engines, I have a certain redundancy built in, which dramatically improves reliability. My plane is now 99.75% reliable. Maybe I can make do with a parachute from the local dollar store? Let us apply this redundancy principle to our accounting processes. Let us say the person preparing an Excel spreadsheet is really clumsy and makes one mistake out of every 20 entries. That is, this employee is only 95% accurate. You then assign a colleague who is also as error prone to review the spreadsheet. The chances that both of them will miss an error is 0.25%. Therefore, even with such incompetent employees, the reliability of your sub-process has jumped up to 99.75%.
Ever wonder why a typical accounting or auditing process involves so many pairs of eyes reviewing every number?